Again, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the introduction. I want to start this uh, conversation with um, this image that was taken in uh, uh, March uh, on March 10 uh, this year, uh, it, and it shows um, one of the most uh, momentous accidents in the recent history of data centers. So in that night, um, two of four server farms of Europe's largest uh, hosting provider, OHV, were destroyed by a fire. And, and both of them contained large amounts of, of data from uh, mostly governmental organizations, but also uh, uh, by uh, uh, game companies. For example, the city of, of Colmar's website collapsed completely, and 3.6 uh, uh, million websites went offline that night, including those of banks and news channels, and uh, also the French government's uh, website. It was an accident which would not have been discussed that much, if the data was actually stored elsewhere or mirrored elsewhere, as they say, and could have been uh, still accessed via other um, data centers. And technically, of course, that would have been uh, possible and necessary, but apparently a number of customers had not paid for synchronization. Among others, the, um, the computer game Rust, uh, the, the players lost all of their data that they accumulated over years. Uh, but even more detrimental were the effects on the government's uh, websites. So you can say what went up in smoke uh, that day was the reassuring idea that our data is stored in a so-called cloud and secured there in an almost like heavenly way, and that, that thanks to cloud technology, uh, it's kind of tr transcended to eternal placeless knowledge, which the, ter the terminology of the cloud, of course, implies. And what became visible in that night and in these uh, images um, that were published was uh, the physicality and the vulnerability of, of data storage. And, uh, and many people, I think, understood for the first time seeing these images in Europe that the cloud is actually a very physical building, that it consumes tons of energy, that it's architecture, and it can even burn down with all its content. So um, the cloud, as it's called, in reality looks like this. And um, we are uh, currently running a, a research program in Frankfurt at the uh, School of Fine Arts on uh, the, the history of the server farm <coughs> and also on uh, the current interest of architects in uh, building server farms and the ide ideological implications that that has. So you can say that server farms are among the most important new building typologies of the 21st century. And of course, in a digital world, they are, in the end of the day, what castles used to be in their time, the, the seat of power. And uh, it's interesting that on the one hand, data centers count among the largest buildings of today. Here you see uh, a new facility by Facebook in the desert. Uh, and at the same time, architects haven't hardly played a role in designing server farms. And you can say, while the interior of the data center with its endless wrecks and flickering lights is quite spectacular. It looks like Tokyo at night. Uh, and it was already dubbed as a new sublime by some architects. The outside looks always like a, or mostly like a generic box. There are exemptions that we will discuss a bit later. Um, so you can say that, that there's a paradoxical situation that the server farm is at the same time the biggest and also the most invisible new building typology. And we can discuss later if uh, like fulfillment centers are a bit similar in that respect. So you can say for a very long time you ha only had to take a quick look at the city and understand you understood where the power was. You had the skyscrapers of Woolworth and Chrysler, they were like, like build exclamation marks uh, and stated where the, the, the actual economic power sits. And uh, whereas today the influence of uh, digital platforms on business and politics is quite obvious, but these shifts in economic and political power are of course not longer reflected in skylines. And uh, there's no such thing as a Google scraper or, uh, or anything else like that in Manhattan. And if you look at Frank Gehry's architecture for the Facebook headquarters that I show you here, I it's quite a telling example for an architecture that makes Facebook look as I if it's almost a natural part of our ecosystem. So it's a math scheme, uh, with a nice roof garden, everything is very ecological, and so it looks like a part of, of nature. And it, 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 in kind of a way, uh, it is this strange combination of omnipresence and invisibility, which is represented also by that that building. Um, you can say that digitalization is driving the city as we know it into a structural crisis, uh, and that we're facing the largest production of ruins in modern history. 
uh, you can say that in the next years the countless uh, post offices, shopping malls, parking garages, office buildings could uh, be empty simply because work will be increasingly relocated to home offices in production, robotized and decentralized. And of course it's an interesting question what a city will be if consumption and work as we know it will vanish from the city centers. And this is a collage of uh, students of mine who basically show a Roman ruin park and the ruins of shopping malls, ruins of uh, uh, Bjarke Ingels' uh, uh, office high-rises and the event of the server farm, almost like a uh, strange army uh, in, in the back. So um, um, basically while uh, the office tower and the shopping mall is under siege, Data centers are uh, a building typology that experiences the most rapid growth in the last years. Uh, in 2019 alone, there were over 3 million data centers in the United States alone, and over 500 so-called hyperscalers, so extremely large data centers. The largest data center in the world, operated by China Telecom, extends over 25 square kilometers near the capital of Inner Mongolia. It's a billion dollar facility with hundreds of thousands of racks and its own city for employees. Um, so when it comes to discussing um, the server farm as a new typology, there are two things uh, that might explain why it's uh, at the same time so big and so invisible. One is pollution because despite all efforts to achieve climate neutrality in the near future, which is a claim that Google often repeats, we are using renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera, most data centers still consume enormous amounts of energy. So every text message, every funny video of a cat, every Instagram post, that you know, as you know, every tweet starts a computer somewhere and that consu computer consumes energy. And uh, we have in this research a lot of material uh, on actually wo where the, the main problems are, are with the, that consumption, but you can summarize it to the statement that if the internet was a country, it would come directly after the United States and China in greenhouse gas emissions, and server farms alone account for 2% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, an example from uh, my country is that uh, in the last year, the data centers in Frankfurt um, used 60% uh, uh, more uh, uh, energy uh, than all 400,000 private households, households in that city together. So <coughs> uh, while energy and pollution is a big uh, uh, problem that is overlooked, partly also because we think that our data is in a very clean cloud somewhere and uh, that there is no uh, ecological footprint, um, well, that is the problem. There's even a bigger problem. And the book that we wrote together with, uh, uh, I wrote it with students of mine and uh, with Francesca Bria, who was the former chief technical officer to the city of Barcelona. So it's a collective work that doesn't focus too much on the question of ecology and of pollution, but on another aspect, uh, which is even a, a bigger problem to our view, which is the question of data ownership. Most server farms look like storehouses, where you find also stolen goods, and that's also basically what they are. The largest hyperscaler, as the big cloud providers are called, is Amazon Web Service, and it's interesting to see that the cloud business is a major contributor to Amazon's uh, incredible profit. So around two-thirds of Amazon's uh, uh, market capitalization depend on AWS, the server farm thing. And the second largest hyperscaler is Microsoft's Azure, and Google falls in third place, and you see uh, looking at these uh, companies, who has uh, also in this respect the, the power. Uh, and it's important to understand that these companies not only collect the data of their users, but they also built the refineries in which it's stored and, uh, and, uh, and valued and processed into products that are then sold to the so-called users. Um, and it's interesting that these companies are allowed to treat the data that they process as their private property. Um, and um, mm, you know uh, all these numbers that the major digital players have achieved a combined stock market value of uh, over 8 trillion now and US tech shares are now more valuable than the entire European stock market which is uh, especially painful for European uh, companies. Um, but it's more important for us also in this research that of course such data centers are also places of predicting and manipulating people's behavior 
and many researchers and theorists of the internet have impressively described how people are manipulated uh, based on the analysis of behavioral data and how algorithms perpetuate and aggravate, for example, ra racist prejudice and social inequality and help to spread false information. You all remember that uh, Cambridge Analytica case. Um, at the same time, it's interesting to see that if you look at what is done in these data centers with the uh, personal data of people, that the health sector shows how digital corporations take over essential public services like healthcare based on the evaluation of private data. And uh, you all know these uh, watches with these uh, programs where even uh, if you uh, move or if you fall or if you stumble, uh, your uh, an algorithm um, um, analyzes what could have happened and you have to basically declare that you're okay. If you're not okay, automatically uh, some some help will be organized. So looking at these products, it's interesting to see that there are already around 380,000 health apps uh, already on available on the market today and the global market value of privatized healthcare estimated is estimated as uh, well over like 500 billion uh, dollars and um, and uh, it was interesting for us in the research to see that uh, it's always said to be more efficient and people will be more secure but uh, uh, when you look at how these algorithms operate and what they basically uh, 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 analyze and w which movements of people are analyzed and harvested uh, then it's quite a questionable thing and uh, we can't go into detail uh, too much here but um, uh, I think also the corona crisis has shown that uh, um, despite the claim that everything becomes more efficient and people friendly, the privatization and transformation of the health sector uh, and of hospitals uh, into profitable assets has not led to medical progress, rather the opposite. Um, so when you, when you analyze what is done with the data in these server farms, it's also interesting to see that, uh, that all these robots that uh, surround us uh, basically delivering data in these data centers and we have done some studies of for example uh, where where the data that cars uh, collect about their drivers uh, are stored and who has access to this data and that is quite also quite dramatic this is an example from uh, a new German car which analyzes the the driver's behavior uh, and if the algorithms come to the conclusion that you're tired you have this symbol of an ugly coffee cup saying attention assist says pause and if you if you say no no but I I know if I'm tired and I'm not tired so I won't make a pause uh, then you might run into legal problems because when you're involved in an accident after the algorithm told you you are tired then you have to prove uh, in court that you were not tired so so the, the other side can read uh, your car so your car is kind of the witness uh, of your tiredness and then you ha you have to prove that you haven't been tired and then you c compete with an algorithm so um, uh, that of course is an important thing to to discuss when when it comes to the question what is actually happening in these data centers uh, and what is done with the data and how is this data also collected and turned against you and it's quite a telling moment that cars who emotionally are still something where you feel protected from the outside have more cameras pointed to the driver than to the outside. So what you call a dashboard is a screen that constantly monitors your behavior, your eye behavior, the movement of your hands, etc. And um, all this data goes into data collection and is harvested and analyzed um, in, in data farms. So um, this, is, uh, this is annoying and, um, and in a way more dramatic even is what uh, Rashida Richardson described in a, in a seminal text called Dirty Data, Bad Predictions, uh, uh, a text about predictive policing tools and how they encode systematic racism with uh, often deadly consequences. And nevertheless, if we all look at that, uh, there's still a general feeling that giving away personal data doesn't cause great damage and everybody knows it that you, we, if we say if we want to access information quite quickly we, we press the accept all button and don't think that we are basically destroying um, mm, uh, forms of self-determination and democracy with it and only recently there has been a movement <coughs> called uh, uh, fuck the algorithm where students in England protested against algorithm that based on uh, previous uh, 
uh, uh, grades given to students before Corona uh, uh, downgraded 40% um, uh, uh, of all students in England because they said it can't be that these students uh, are better than generations before, so we downgrade them to, uh, to the level, uh, the median uh, level. Um, so that was the first movement where people gathered and demonstrated against, uh, against algorithms and the use of algorithms in, um, uh, in, in uh, judging these students. Um, another, uh, another thing that we did while we were analyzing the architecture of server farms is the architecture of the other side. So um, Google, for example, uh, Google's uh, uh, sister company, Sidewalk Lab, had proposed this uh, idyllic uh, vision of a city of the future for the city of Toronto. Uh, it, it looks like everything was done rightly, everything is built from wood, there's a green space and there are bicycles and people spend their time looking at art, as you can see in the lower uh, uh, corner. So it's a, it looks like a paradise, but of course it's uh, just a robot wrapped with timber. Uh, and uh, the deal would have been that people pay with their data and that Google will basically replace all public services like healthcare and security with private firms. So in this case, luckily people in Toronto have stopped the project, so it won't happen, but the idea was basically that every civic right, every fundamental civic right would have been turned into uh, a commodity, into a service, which is of course a... a, a has never happened in the history of the city before. And, um, and this discourse is, of course, also linked to the question of what's happening in, in, in server farms and uh, what is done with the data if we, as a society, don't reclaim it. It's interesting that Toronto was an example for how also cities have given up on the whole idea of digitalization and are handing it over, luckily, to private companies, uh, which hasn't been the case in the in the 70s uh, and even the the, the 50s, where um, basically um, server farms, the early server farms, were designed uh, uh, by by architects, were paid by the state, and there was a culture of of a public server farm that starts with the ENIAC in 1946. Uh, and which is also described in the New York Times as an aesthetic epiphany with all the flickering lights. So it was all from the very first moment that we have something that we could call a sur first uh, uh, data center uh, that was uh, uh, taking care of its aesthetic effects. Um, and later in East Europe, <coughs> Eastern Europe, people were very uh, proud of, uh, of uh, designing server farms as a part of the public infrastructure. Uh, here's the data center in Potsdam um, that was built in the middle of the city, so they destroyed a Prussian dome where uh, basically Hitler held a speech in 33, uh, took it down and built a server farm instead to express uh, uh, their optimistic vision of the future. Uh, and there was a lot of imagery published of women working there on the future and even, uh, even a, a, b a beautiful uh, mosaic was uh, showing people working on computers and working in a server farm uh, working with uh, 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 public data. Um, the last uh, glorious moment of uh, um, uh, a data center room uh, that was uh, designed as a message to the citizens that here they will start a new um, uh, era uh, in, uh, in running a country in governance was when Guy Bonsieper, a German designer, was commissioned to design the control room of uh, a, a, a supercomputer, CyberSyn, uh, designed by uh, uh, Stafford Beer um, uh, for Allende, where they wanted to coordinate the production of all nationalized uh, big factories in Chile. Um, so they had these seats that were designed uh, quite funny because with the right hand you could take decisions on the left on the left side of these chairs, you would put your whiskey glass in, uh, and an, uh, you had an ashtray. Uh, while you were taking decisions, you could drink and smoke. Uh, this thing was destroyed before it even uh, uh, started to be operational uh, when uh, Allende uh, uh, was became the victim of that putsch. And ever since, there was a long period uh, where basically nothing happened in terms of design and metaphorical design and symbolic design of uh, server farms and data centers. And the whole thing was privatized and almost hidden. And only recently, you see the uh, event of a new uh, like uh, design appetite in 
um, in server farms. This is um, Equinix data center in Amsterdam, the biggest provider uh, uh, host uh, company in, in, in Amsterdam. Um, mm, uh, and they take pride on their website in calling this uh, an act of making the invisible visible and the abstract data cloud, I still quote, abstract data cloud is wrapped in an impressive tower uh, where 12 stories of servers facilitate our internet traffic. So there's a moment where these things uh, now become visible again. There's even a data center architecture award claiming um, on the website data center architecture should look good and looking good is, um, is for example, this, uh, a pyramid um, uh, that uh, alludes, of course, to Faroonian ideas of control and power. Um, then you have uh, uh, also a new form of high-rise buildings. Before, before we mostly had uh, flat buildings. This is the proposal um, um, of, uh, of Schneider and Schumacher in Shenzhen, where you have the facade built um, from um, like a sequined dress uh, of zeros and ones that uh, move in the wind to display uh, an idea of uh, the digital age. This is a transformed uh, church in Barcelona, so almost a new form of religious admiration of service, something holy. This is um, <laughs> really one of the most annoying uh, design proposals for the future server farm by Snohetta. Uh, uh, a company that proposes here a server farm that is very eco-friendly. Everything is built from local stone and wood. Um, it is developed for um, um, for the Nokia Group and the real estate of Miris, and it proposes that on the roof, the people whose data is harvested downstairs, uh, these people can uh, harvest some vegetables on the roof and look at a, a, a contemplate a, a, um, an Asian pond on the roof, So, which is kind of a, a, a bad deal. Huh? Uh, your, your data is uh, uh, basically used downstairs and you can uh, uh, pick uh, berries and look into the water. And by, by at no point, the question is addressed who owns the data, what is done with the data. So basically you can say architects um, become decorators of that uh, new form of uh, uh, private buildings. So, um, and I'm, I'm seeing I'm uh, almost over time, so I, I rushed through it quickly. So given the situation that there is a new architectural appetite for designing server farms, but it's mostly a design that uh, helps to not address the pressing question of who owns the data, what could, it, what could be done with data if data was um, a common good and not something that uh, uh, can be used as a private property by companies. We started to look into a history of uh, very ambitious projects where the state uh, tried to develop a new form of buildings for uh, different typology types of governance. This is a uh, Conrad Waxman design for the California Civic Center. The idea was to create a huge public space where people could gather, uh, a town hall and a, a TV uh, station that would allow people in, uh, uh, in this uh, 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 town, California city, um, to um, to participate directly in decision making. So it's a hybrid of a physical space, a digital uh, or technological space, uh, and, um, and that was very, very important. Uh, then we looked into the history of um, educational buildings where um, here in, in Germany, um, mm, in uh, the 50s, people had a public library that looked almost like a private bungalow where they could read books and uh, and uh, as kind of an educational architecture. And here in Sao Paulo, uh, one of the last buildings of pa uh, Paulo Mendes, uh, uh, da Rocha, um, that which is a transformed uh, building with a library, educational facilities, and a huge public pool on the roof. And this all to, to come to the question, could we imagine that the state, uh, uh, the public hand re-engages in designing a space that could be something that uh, would be a, a mixture of a fun palace and a centre pompidou for the for the digital age. It would be a space where people could come together and understand what's actually happening, what could be done with data, if data would be seen as a common good. It's something that uh, you have control of as a citizen and, and that the state and private companies have to ask you for your permission to, to work with it and to create more of a transp uh, transparent form of 
data use than we know it today. And so my students started to work, and this is a preliminary first sketch, um, but they did that I liked in a way for two aspects that they uh, are stressing here. One is the idea that people could actually march on top of a server farm and that the roof of the server farm is a public space and that you have kind of a center of digital sovereignty to the right, it's a uh, uh, circular uh, element and uh, other public facilities and library so uh, that you have kind of a, uh, of a public building where the whole discussion on what could be done with data can become also a public thing and uh, and to create a server farm which is not just vanishing in the uh, in the anonymous generic uh, boxes that we find it uh, uh, in today so I will stop here because I'm very happy that uh, Jesse is here and we'll talk about the other anonymous box that we uh, see if we drive outside the city which is um, the fulfillment center so thank you very much for uh, listening and I, I hand over to Jesse thanks uh, thank you thank you Nicholas um, thank you all for you to, for coming thank you to, to Jurgen and Catherine and the, the Goethe Institute um, I feel a bit like the um, the opener following the headline headlining act so I'm um, I'm very grateful to be able to to uh, join tonight as a big um, as a big fan and as someone who's enthusiastic about this discussion. Um, I am going to present this work in a way that I haven't presented it before, so it's a kind of um, it's a bit of an experiment. So I'm grateful for the chance to to do that. I want to make sure I don't knock my water over. Speaking of data centers. Um, so I, yeah, as, as uh, you mentioned, I'm the, uh, I wrote this book about Walmart and it's um, the role of architecture in in the logistical operation. And the the, the book is, um, oops, the book is, oops, trying to advance here. There it goes. Um, so this book is is about the the. The, the physical manifestations of, of, of Walmart's activities, but Walmart becomes a stand-in for um, a, a major logistical actor, which in the past few years is, is, um, has been challenged, of course, by Amazon, and, and as, as I anyone who's been following it, and I'm sure if you're in this room, you have been, Amazon is well on the way to, to, eclipse, it, to eclipse Walmart, uh, both in terms of its revenue, in terms of its footprint, um, interestingly, though, because it's not a physical retailer, it doesn't have a, it has a very different relationship to uh, its buildings. One thing that we can talk about later, perhaps, is the difference between Walmart and Amazon. And one thing that I think is um, fundamental is that they're two totally different organizations. Walmart is a retailer. Amazon is really uh, a systems builder. The book uh, is organized around questions of scale and technology. So each section looks at a different piece of the of the logistical puzzle, the buildings, the the way they the way the company decides how to locate buildings, the people who work in those buildings, and then what it means to be the headquarters of what was the largest corporation on the planet to be headquartered in a relatively remote part of the country. But tonight, um, I, I wanted to sort of summarize this in a very um, in in a very kind of condensed way around a series of images, evocative images. I hope. Uh, and a series of uh, a kind of narr narration that I'll I'll um, I'll read, but this is this is in a way summarizes some of the pieces of the book, and it it begins with a claim that we can no longer read what we write, but we still celebrate the birth of this new era of computer languages. This is the the happy birthday to the barcode. The barcode. Um, this is uh, June June seventeenth is barcode the barcode's birthday, and every every year at the this one store in Ohio where they first scanned the first product. They still have cake, uh, and it's, it's sort of like to me the beginning of this whole era that Nicholas has just described so evocatively. This moment of basically surrendering to a machinic uh, language, which is written by machines for machines. This is the thing about the barcode is that it's illegible to us uh, humans, and it turns information into a kind of physical thing, but it also makes objects into kind of sp spectral things in the sense that every time something is scanned produces a kind of machinic double. So every object in circulation in a logistical regime has its twin circulating through these, these data 
spaces. And as a result, as we've just seen, this new machine environment is also changing us. This is an image from a Motorola patent drawing showing an operator in a logistical building. You note, for example, there's, there, his eyes are closed, he's, he's missing a hand, and from a kind of uh, media analysis, this is evocative of a lot of the ways that media are described as, as extensions uh, of ourselves, even though we, we give up other uh, sensory uh, abilities. So we have to find ways to understand the codes that we ourselves wrote. We have to create new tools to decrypt an environment that we created. Uh, here is a wearable scanner. And so we try, we, we find ways to translate these codes. We try to keep up with the intensity of logistical environments. If you've been following the news around Amazon, you know that a lot of the discussion is around the incompatibility of the logistical systems with frail humans uh, and the inability or unwillingness of a company like Amazon to adjust to that. Uh, this is an image of a company called, uh, this is an exoskeleton that was designed to, to assist in lifting heavy objects. But in a certain way, we get merged with these, with these environments. We become uh, almost engulfed by them. This is a, a, an early technology called uh, automated storage and retrieval systems where you can see there's a human somewhere in there and, and he's driven around by this crane that's moving through this high density uh, storage. And we have to find ways to regulate this. The, this is a fidget spinner, if you remember those. But, but I love this because the fidget spinner was sort of meant to be kind of like a, a tool to quell anxiety, but it's underpinned by the, the ball bearing, which is one of the key uh, features of any kind of logistical operation. And as a result, we increasingly are uh, regulated by various forms of machines around us, like we've just seen with something like the Apple Watch. And indeed, I think this kind of mechanical vision that, that the environment is increasingly subjected to uh, turns its attention to us as mechanical creatures. And we've known that you know, with ergonomics, with, with scientific management, people have tried to make the body mechanical, and that same quest for precision has spread out to our environment. And this, this image for me is a kind of totemic image from my own uh, excursion into the built environment of logistics, because what you see here is the data the objects that are in the warehouse are, are re rendered in the same way the building is rendered, as, as pieces of information to get uh, manipulated and optimized. But you could argue that the more we, we demand the kind of total environment, uh, management of our environment, we become increasingly incompatible with those, that, that we're not getting any more machinic even though our environments are increasingly so. And so to cope, we have to conjure helpers. This is my, my nod to, the, the, to get to here. This is a, an illustration from The Sorcerer's Apprentice uh, where, where he sort of summons technology that he quickly cannot control. And these things inhabit a landscape all of their own. This is an image from Amazon's patent drawing of their robots that help to support their warehouses. All of this in support of really irrational and fickle things, which is human desire. So a lot of this is driven by you know, our own kind of um, fickle and our own kind of impulsive demand. So these vast mechanical landscapes underpin this quest to satisfy desire, uh, we call them fulfillment centers. And I think that the unintentional double entendre of the fulfillment center for me is one that's really hard to give up. And it's, 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 like it's low hanging fruit, certainly, but it's fascinating to think about the twin of that language, the, the kind of notion that to a, a, a logistics manager, a fulfillment is course of just this picking, packing, shipping, stowing, all that stuff. But from the point of view of you know, personal happiness, fulfillment is the sort of deepest thing you can seek out. This is, this is the good life that you're looking for. This is the eudaimonic kind of way of understanding a lifestyle that's more than just um, you know, impulsive consumption. And yet, this is exactly what's happening. And these create what you could see in a way as a kind of wilderness of machines because we can't, for the most part, understand the logic that's driving them. And these, these, um, these systems start to get equated with machines. These living systems start to get confused. We talk about flow of goods the way we talk about uh, the flow of materials, even though, of course, they do anything but. So there's this language of naturalizing logistics, even though it's, of course, uh, incredibly difficult and incredibly slow. And these entire landscapes of fulfillment have emerged to enable the movement of things. This is an image of the Amazon Fulfillment Center in Robbinsville, uh, New Jersey, just sort of north of, of Philly. And our environments, I think, become more indifferent to us just as our cities become increasingly modeled on the machines they house. So the, the imagery of the smart city, and I think the, these examples um, that we just saw are kind of hints of this, where there's a kind of um, fantasy of a certain way of seeing how we should manage cities, even though um, those things, I think, are increasingly incompatible. So Walmart 
uh, was a pioneer in developing the logistical environment. Um, I'm going to just talk quickly about three of their building types that are the kind of uh, foundation of their operations, the, the super center, the data center, and the distribution center. And I think one way that I found useful to think through them was a relationship between content and form. So what passes through the building versus how the building is manifest physically, spatially, aesthetically. And so the super center has um, a fixed interior in the sense that Walmart um, is very precise in how they, how they plan out the interior, but the exterior is quite loose. They develop it as a prototype that has um, this kind of malleable crust. So as it gets instantiated, they can change it, they, they being the architects of record. And this is in a way how the research started. Uh, I was reading an article about Walmart and was understanding that they were building buildings and I thought, how many buildings do they build every year? And then it turns out they have to open a new building like every two days. And that's really astonishing if you think about the speed of that, if you're opening a 300,000 square foot building every few days, how do you possibly do that? How do you possibly control that? And this is one of the ways they do that is through the, the speeding of that process. Um, and then the distribution centers, these are the kind of core pieces of their logistical facility. This is all about content. The form is, is, is not important. It's really just the most expedient way of, of producing an envelope to keep the weather out as they facilitate the exchange of input from suppliers to output uh, to delivery on, onward to the retail centers. And then last, of course, the data center. This is Walmart's proprietary data center that's rendered as a bunker outside of their headquarters. And in this case, the form is quite fixed because once you build a bunker, it's hard to change it, but the content uh, is constantly changing, not just because of the data that's being circulated through here, but also the, um, the way in which the, the servers are getting more and more efficient. And one study that's now a few years old um, estimated that Walmart was responsible for something like 2% of the world's data because of the number of uh, transactions that they record. And so as a way of, of concluding, I wanted to point to one um, thinker who I find really useful thinking about logistics, and it's Paul Edwards, who writes about infrastructure and technology, because a lot of, for me, like logistics is a kind of subspecies of infrastructure. It's a way of understanding the possibilities of infrastructure. And, and Edwards talks about functional continuity versus technological innovation. And he, he claims that if, we, if you follow functional continuity, you actually see growth rather than disappearance. So he uses the example of gaslighting. He says, you know, that might be dead, but artificial light illuminates the world. We don't use a telegraph, but, you know, of course, we're more and more uh, in touch than ever before. And I find this is a view out of my office window, uh, and I find it, I, I am totally amazed by this image. So this is, um, you know, for those of you, you know, water, the, the water towers in New York are key because this is how you keep the fire suppression and, and, and things like that. And this is the MTA building that has wrapped a fake curtain wall around the water tower so that people like me would not, will somehow not see it. Because otherwise, no, you can't see it from anywhere else except above it. So, and obviously there's no glass here. So this is the sort of moment of trying to reckon with our infrastructural legacies. Um, however, I think with the data center, it's actually the opposite of what uh, Edwards claims. I think it's a switch. I think we've actually mistaken functional change for technological innovation. And actually we're witnessing a, a watershed shift in, in what data is and what the data centers are. And we're trying to, we're misapprehending it as technical, technological continuity. So we're actually, we're reading it as something that's similar, like in architecturally, we're seeing these things as warehouses, farms. We need a new language for these, these things. We, it's, we're ill-equipped to understand what these things are and we're trying to figure out how they work. And so I think for me, it's useful to think to other moments of typological innovation uh, or lack thereof to understand where we might be. So this is of the famous, you, I'm sure you've seen this image, this famous um, derailment at Montparnasse at the end of the 19th century. Uh, in this case, you know, the new content exceeded the form of the building in a violent way where the train's uh, speed was too much for the station itself, partly because of, of poor coordination on the drivers. But I wonder at what point will the content of these data centers start to spill out? At what point do these become actually uh, public in a meaningful way? And I think that this, for me, um, is a question of how we might see ourselves in our data which is probably what Nicholas has been pointing to. And indeed, from a, the a kind of media point of view, we often talk about how we see ourselves in our data, how our phones become extensions of ourselves. Um, John Durham Peters, in his amazing book, The Marvelous Clouds, talks about these as 
you know, it's not, it's like, you know, almost like losing a limb. It's not that our life is in here, but we live our lives by the means of these things. Those things are all, of course, fueled by the cloud. And on my, on the, the right hand of the screen, this is a simulation of a, of an Amazon distribution center. And what's, the animation is not, um, not working, alas, but what you would see is a sort of gradual transformation. The blue are the things that no one wants. The red are things that are people buying all the time. And in a certain way, this is a portrait of our own desire, but unlike the portrait of Narcissus, we can't read it. And so the question, I think, is at what point do we, if we see ourselves in our data centers, what do we want them to look like? You know, how do we see our own reflection, and how do we demand that become something that reflects us and not something else? Thank you. With that last image you show, which talks a lot about illegibility uh, of the data farm, I think that is a crucial thing because, of course, um, a data farm per se is not a not a bad space, but uh, but what turns it into a problem is that no one can understand what's actually happening inside, who has access to this, and and I think one of the the crucial things is um, basically to find ways to repoliticize the discourse in a way that you impose rules. Um, to those who process data to make it legible to, to people. And I think that's something that maybe also for the audience is quite interesting because if we constantly say we have to reclaim data and we, we have to get it back in our hands, then the question is, of course, uh, what could we do with it? When, wh who is we? Huh? And, and what can we do with it? And I think um, to understand that a little bit better, it's, it's interesting to look into what happened in the city of Barcelona when, when Francesca Bria became the chief technical officer. She had an algorithm written uh, in the decode project um, that prevents your, your, your data from being harvested by private companies. So it's basically like a block in your phone uh, and a company like Telecom or, uh, or Uber cannot just take the data out, out of your, your behavioral data out of your phone and they have to subscribe to certain rules. And it was always said it's not technically not possible and they proved it is possible. And the next step, what they did as town planners, and that's why I think in that whole discourse on the city, uh, on, on digital, the city is an important uh, 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 place to reclaim it. They said, okay, if we have written an algorithm that prevents people from uh, just losing their data, what can they do with their data? The city could ask the people, can we use certain, some of your data, for example, to understand better how you move, how much water you consume. And already today, in a city like Berlin, if you ask city officials, so what is the real-time water consumption, electricity consumption, they say, uh, we have no idea because it's delegated to private companies who have the data, and the city of Berlin gets a PDF every three months. And so this means that the whole city can't be governed anymore. So what we face there is a loss of uh, the possibility of, of governance in a way. And and what they did in Barcelona was to, to create a platform, a public platform called DC DIM, where people of the city of Barcelona could uh, make proposals of how to redesign the city. So the, the citizens became an active member of, uh, of a community that was basically doing town planning. And so that shifted the whole idea of town planning uh, to uh, an, an amazing point where like 400,000 people in Barcelona were constantly making proposals. These proposals were collected by an algorithm and then turned very quickly in policy. So um, that, that is an example when, when the question comes up, yeah, but what should we do with, with that data? It's basically the question if governance is still in the hand of the people or, or not. But what I found interesting in, in the things you show us in the book is is that, that the outside of these facilities is, if I remember it rightly, always quite generic. Huh? So uh, fulfillment centers always a m mostly a white box. Are there, is there any change? Because in the design of server farms, there's this new ambition to express power simply because there's such a competition uh, for people who should put their content there that you have to uh, advertise your server farm. Is there a similar thing with uh, fulfillment centers or will they ever stay white boxes? I think that the, uh, well, first of all, I think that, that, I mean, it's a great example from Barcelona. Um, but I, and I appreciate the connection to the, the role of architectural representation because the, it seems to be one of the questions at, at the moment is the, the role of architectural representation vis-a-vis -a, -vis a kind of civic imagination. And so 
that is as sort of amazing as that. I mean, that, that the Barcelona example is a great one for thinking about, like thinking really brilliantly around the data itself, but then the kind of, you know, architectural equivalent of that um, remains something that's still being sorted out. And so the question of, I think, the fulfillment versus data comparison, I think, is, is interesting around the way that the kind of market is structured for those things, where a lot of the, like in the, in the big sort of, like with well with Walmart, they all of their for the most part, their fulfillment centers are are in house, and so they don't have to. There's no branding. There's no differentiation that's necessary. They don't have to compete for the hearts and minds of clients. Whereas I think in the data sector, it's increasingly um, important. And that um, someone described it recently as, as a, there were these different phases, but that now it's the, in the kind of sexy fortress phase where you have to be strong, but you know, also seductive and, and secure, but you know, inviting somehow. And that, I think, for me, is also where the kind of um, historical relationships are interesting around the emergence of different typologies that were once not public, um, like, the, like the bank was never imagined as having an interface until eventually it started to, to, art to get articulated as a place where the public would go or the library, you know, potentially also one of those things that was imagined as a storehouse and hard to imagine why anyone would, would need to go there. And so I think for me, I'm wondering, Nicholas, in your case, is if, if you've seen other evidence of the ways that not just like, the, like that's, that Snehada example, sure, where, you know, the public can kind of be on top of it, but, you know, are there moves, is there a way to think about the, the data itself as being meaningfully public? You know, will there be a way to think through what the, the kind of access is, of it is, and it's tr tr tricky because the nature of the interface is not, you know, yeah, aligned I mean, to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was basically interested in the connection of the physical space of the city and what happens in the so-called digital revolution, right? because we see that the whole idea of the public space is uh, 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 put into question by what, what we experience right now, and the question is what could be a new form of public space, and there were certain, like, heroic moments in the history of the welfare state where uh, uh, forms like the Centre Pompidou emerged as a space of collective education, uh, collective experiencing of culture. So this was all focused on the idea of culture. And the question that came up in the seminar that I'm running in Frankfurt is, isn't there an appetite to uh, go somewhere in a physical space to learn with other people what could be done with data? And so I think there are two things that should not be confounded. One is a political demand for regarding data as uh, a, a common good, as part of the public infrastructure, which basically uh, at first has nothing to do with architecture, as a political question, should we um, regard data not as something that can be harvested in a Wild West method by private companies, or should we say it's like um, private companies cannot just build roads uh, in the country. This is part of the public infrastructure. It depends on political decision. So this is the first, I think, crucial thing that has to happen now that we uh, declare politically data a common good um, and that we implement algorithms to stop the, the kind of processing and harvesting to very questionable uh, goals and in questionable methods as described by all these uh, analysis of uh, embedded racism, et cetera. And the other thing is, um, where is a space where we would understand, like politicians, kids, students, what could be done with data? And that it comes to learning how to code. It's also learning to understand the size of that revolution. And I think that whenever you take a group of, uh, of students to a server farm, they're completely blown away that it's like almost a kilometer long. Uh, sometimes, and you get an, uh, an idea of how big this changes if you see it physically. So one of these ideas that I showed at the end was to put the server farm, which is always a hidden thing, into the city and let people occupy it, not as a pathetic formal gesture, but really as, uh, as uh, a space where people could also uh, protest and gather and learn and spend time together, because there's I mean, what, what is left after the um, uh, work and consumption have left the city and after a kind of a hyper-capitalist revolution that killed the, the spaces that formerly killed the old city. So shopping malls and office towers were 
as everybody knows, regarded after Jane Jacobs as the destroyers of the classical city. Now, capitalism has destroyed these two destroyers. Um, to, and, and that's why I found your, your research so intriguing and important, because the shift from Walmart to, to Amazon is also a shift from going to a Walmart uh, shop, like physically shopping, uh, to ordering things. Uh, and I think that is also an interesting shift that we might also discuss a little bit. Uh, deeper. Yeah, 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 definitely. And I, I think that the last uh, year and a half has been um, obviously very kind to Amazon and to the shipping industry, but this is something Amazon's been like preparing us for for a long time. Like they're super happy <laughs> in a way that this is all happening because they've been wanting us for so long to be, you know, at home alone ordering things and communicating remotely because this is the political side of that I think is is the kind of isolated, we're isolated as political subjects and, and we're seeing the reflection of ourselves in our own algorithmic demands. And I think what, for me, that, that shift from, from Amazon's, the Amazon's growth vis-a-vis -vis Walmart's growth, I think is really significant around Amazon Web Services and that the identity of Amazon, like their ability to identify server provision as a utility. So if you think of the other things that we rely on as utilities like power, water, et cetera, those things are scalable in the sense that like if you leave the water running as long as you want, then you'll, you'll pay the price for it, but you can potentially do that. And I think Amazon's understanding that they have the infrastructure to, to offer scalable data was really profound, and that allowed all of these other sort of sub uh, startups to, to take advantage of that. But the con I think conceptually, AWS is a data utility in a way that I think for me is a really ironic sort of twist because that's the, that's a public conception, you know, the idea that the kind of the state provides those services, but here Amazon is offering that and then housing the, the, the state's data. But I, wouldn't it be interesting, I mean, like a lot of you love that last image, it's so exciting of that, of that project. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing if you could opt in to, you know, like your municipal data center instead of your AWS data center or your Azure center or something like that. Yeah, sure, and that, that is also, I think, the main idea that the, the, the role of the state is kind of turned from maniac to depressive over the last 50 years. So the state, as I, as I showed in these images, uh, the, the state, the government, took server farms and data centers as the iconic image of future progress and optimism in the West like in the East. And then mysteriously this vanished, and also this aesthetic appetite vanished too. And if you ask yourself, what are the big typologies that the public hand is building in the city, there's not much but some museums maybe. Huh? So uh, if you look at my city, Berlin, they built one museum after the other, then they, they rebuilt the castle to turn it into a museum, but the museum is the only answer to the question, what is public life? So it's tourism and Looking at art, and uh, and and it's I, I think it's it's almost ironic that even in these uh, image images in the imagery of Google, what will people do in the new city in the eco timber super city where people pay with the data? What will they do while Google is doing the other job? They look at art, hmm? so they look at sculptures. They b cycle around, or they look at art. There's nothing else to do. So the whole idea of gathering of of an empty space where thousands of people could gather and, uh, and, and protest or celebrate is completely eradicated from these designs. And I think that is quite telling. The idea of public masses is eliminated from all these design proposals. And I think that's quite uh, interesting. But I have another question because I have no idea of, um, of how people at Walmart react to that moment of total crisis of their concept. Is there an appetite or a belief that redesigning um, the actual Walmart shops could help or have they given up on the idea of shop architecture completely and try to become more Amazonized? I mean, I think that it, the, the 5,000 or so stores are pretty reliably shopped at. I think it's partly because of the um, the the nature of what they're selling um but they are th it's a it's a threat and i think that the company is is um trying to catch up through through the kind of equivalent online uh, pr services that that's that that amazon is is ex is exceeding but i think at the end of the day it's a it's it's the you know walmart is another 
it's it's a species that will that I mean it's, they're just it's it's they're two totally different organizations. So I think one, I think you can compare them to a degree, but at the end of the day, like Amazon is busy building systems, Walmart um, is a brick and mortar retailer, and so I think their days are numbered in that in that sense. Like I don't think they're going to have a dramatic reinvention. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think it's such an interesting moment when such a big company faces a uh, sudden death almost and how they react try to do they try to copy amazon or do they still pretend that the uh, uh the sensation of going to shop physically is something that will save them and i think that's something that is also reflected in the current discourse in the city where predictions range from like systemic optimism to apocalypse huh? and, and those who believe in the city as a space where we will meet always say yeah but people want to meet they want to go shopping together and and I, I wonder whether this is reflected in strategies at Walmart or I mean potentially one thing to keep in mind with Walmart like they never believed in the city like they don't believe in the city like that's the, even like Walmart. But they, they believe in physical shopping so they do oh, yeah. they do and so that was their sort of gambit was that you could put a store within a 20 mile drive and people would go there and buy food for a week and at, at, mm. a, at like cut rate and go go home um, and I, I have a sense that 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 those habits die hard around getting things like produce and things like that so I think that the and there's a different kind of economy to Amazon in a, in a place like New York mm. than in distributed parts of the center of America mm. so I, do, I think that their model you know has a resilience has a well, it's not has a robustness to it that that will kind of weather this a little bit. Like, I don't think it's a sort of cliff, but I don't think that the Amazon sites, you know, are set on a different target than Walmart's are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because in both cases, you have a, a question of what happens to the typology. And, and in the case of the of the server farm, it's clearly, I think the, the basic question is, will there be a new culture of public server farms run by the state with the promise of making data processing uh, understandable, legible, and transparent? I think that is the main thing. And, and the, then the question is, will it translate into a different typology of architecture too? Huh? Uh, well, I think this is, for me, what's so exciting about what you're describing is that there's a kind of political imagination, uh, a kind of infrastructural, imagination as, as, as citizens where the you you acquire new habits like these are new skills that we need to be able to participate and I think that example like your kind of analysis of the like the sidewalk labs drawings are so um, apt because this kind of distracted leisure class that's just like cycling and looking at art there it's there it's not the kind of it's it's not a sustainable form of citizenry and so I think this is this is such an interesting question about how to develop those kind of civic practices and how that how we the challenges of doing that when something seemingly kind of complex and illegible as vast systems of big data and so the kind of translation and I think architecture is a fantastic medium to translate those possibilities into space and so I think this is a, a wonderful way to describe the challenges we we have to meet yeah and also I think it's important that you have an architectural response or almost a formal response to the effect that we are running into a situation where basically some people will be able to afford uh, certain fundamental rights like mm -hmm. privacy uh, and the right to be left alone and others uh, due to their social economic situation have to accept all these immoral offers like mm -hmm. uh, like Verizon and, and other companies offered uh, uh, a discount on, on phone calls if you accept uh, personalized uh, ads. And so basically, the most vulnerable p people in a society are almost forced uh, to take every uh, uh, every reduction and uh, sell their data. So, but the, the, what they sell is basically uh, an unalienable personal right. And that is, I think, uh, a moment where basically uh, elemental civic rights are turned into commodities. Uh, and, and I think also architecture should have an answer to, to that split in the society. But I think, Jörg, you, you thought we should open the discourse to the public, which we're happy to do. Um, so maybe there are questions. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Niklas and Jesse. And that's exactly the, the idea. So thank you so much for the inputs and for the conversation. We would like to open it up to you. So if you give me a sign, we've got the third microphone in a second, I'll come to you and would ask you to quickly introduce yourself and then pose, to the, uh, pose your question. And if you wish, it's like directly, it either directly to um, Jesse or to Nicholas, or if you want both of them to answer a sec, then you can say so as well. 
First question is up here. Uh, yeah, my name is Arielle. Uh, I had a question. So I think one thing that I was struck by both of your presentations and obviously kind of the internet and data topic more broadly is the kind of question of centrality versus decentralized. And I think there is the idea of the, the internet that it's like very decentralized and then, you know, you started with this image of showing that how centralized it is. Um, and I, yeah, I was interested also then how you were talking about this kind of political question. And so thinking about, uh, yeah, these kind of contradictions between like decentralized and centralized and how that relates to political questions. Um, so thinking about like, yeah, do we need like a strong kind of state? Do we need to nationalize? And also at the same time, what are the possibilities for like decentralizing to kind of democratize that way and how you think about kind of those political questions? Yeah, thank you for, for the answer. I, I think it's, it's an extremely important point and of course there is some hope because in the future because there's so much complex data that has to be processed very quickly locally, we will uh, uh, have a moment when we have still these hyperscalers run by big corporations, but we also will have a decentralized network of local service. And also some of the research we're doing is on the question of could there be local data centers run by the state like the small public libraries in, in small towns were uh, that collect data and that interconnect without being connected to a central big server farm, which always is uh, endangering uh, uh, the data to be harvested by, by these companies. So decentralized data is a technical necessity in the coming years and it could be turned into a political asset to, to, uh, to fight this tendency to, to concentrate power in certain in certain places. Um, so I think the question of decentralized data is, is really, really important. Um, you want to say? I think it's, it's such an important point, and it's one of the things that's, um, that makes the, the topic so kind of um, you know, slippery because of the, the uh, kind of misapprehension. I mean, that example, the, the sort of first example notwithstanding, but you know, the, the, the kind of 2n plus 1 uh, ideas of data redundancy and, and all of the, the the, the challenges of visualizing you know, packet switching and however data is sort of pulled apart and recalibrated and reconstituted re makes it impossible to sort of say like this is where that thing is or, or usually um, except for the fire <laughs> which is that example is amazing because it seems like it kind of puts li a lie to all of the sto stories we hear about decentralization. Um, I mean I think it's, it's also, um, I mean I think it's ironic that at this moment if you want to sort of drop out of, of kind of big corporate data services, you have to then create your own private like mesh network or you have to sort of, if you want to do that beyond just like your house or something. And so then um, that's, that's, th that's a different kind of political response, which is to sort of withdraw. And so I think that there's, I'm, I'm interested in, I ho and hopeful that we can develop, we, you know, I, you know the, collectively we can think about ways to capture some of the capacities of a kind of decentralized infrastructural imagination that, that was capable of, of making dramatic transformations, but, but maybe at a kind of minor decentralized scale. So, you know, how do we sort of, so, because I think there were, there was the, there were these moments where there was an infrastructural w will, uh, political will to, to make these, you know, massive projects, but we know those came, brought with them a series of, a uh, number of problems, and so how do we, not give up on that idea of a kind of larger imagination, but but manifest it through smaller scale, um, you know, inter interventions or, or decentralized interventions. So I think that's where, for me, actually, like I learned a lot from looking at the way Walmart does it. It's not that it, I mean they're totally centralized from a planning point of view, but they then they kind of decentralize their building production through these um, architects of records who basically are given a recipe uh, and the go ahead, and then they make the, they modify them as needed, and then they build them, and so. I think that there's some ways to kind of redirect that potentially. I, mean, my, I, I might add a quick, um, quick comment also on the question of uh, decentralized political resistance to centralized power systems. And I think a very hopeful example was what was called the network of rebellious cities. Because at the moment when certain cities saw that, that um, uh, Uber and uh, Airbnb uh, uh, had completely intrans practices in the cities causing harm to certain neighborhoods, uh, of course, everybody said, and this is kind of a depressive narrative that we all just should not buy, is what can a city do against a global platform? And 
mm, the outcome was that, of course, uh, the resistance of San Francisco and of Amsterdam against Uber and uh, Airbnb was hard to manage. But when all these cities connected to the so-called network of rebellious cities, which is Barcelona and Copenhagen and New York, uh, is I think also part of it now, were just a network of cities where the mayors uh, connected to impose certain rules to digital platforms, then all of a sudden it became uh, a, a thing for Airbnb if they're not present in like 50 uh, cities with over a million uh, people then it becomes something uh, which is uh, detrimental to their business model so they have to accept certain rules so it shows that very quickly by connecting local bottom up uh, efforts to resist the the, um, the impact of platforms they could create powerful tools beyond national and even uh, global borders, and I think that was an interesting and very hopeful example of how a decentralized protest could connect and create uh, a kind of a counter narrative and a counter force to, to these uh, tendencies. I saw we have at least four more questions, so I suggest we stay on this side of the aisle, it's like for the first one, and then move it on to three more questions. And we'll start here. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, um, journalist and and uh, director of a nonprofit that's been working on this project that has to do with uh, trying to imagine another global planetary planetary future of or a system of governance that would take advantage of the technical capacities among other things offered by you know new forms of logistical you know information uh, da data uh, scientific knowledge social t social scientific research about how we function what motivates us and one one of the one of the questions is could there not be a a, a kind of global governance that is both hyper local uh, uh, connected to in the same way that the the sophisticated logistic logistical systems draw from very individualized and hyperlocal so, sort, sorts of systems, motivations um, to drive a, a, a system of global governance that is capable of, for instance, handling world crisis, uh, environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. And are there examples of non-profit seeking uh, pri primarily, apart from Wikipedia, um, systems like this that could yeah. could be models. Yeah. Do, do you want to? I mean, I mean, I think a, a very telling example is what is actually happening in the uh, uh, healthcare systems and the health uh, health sector. That after the experiences of the pandemic in Europe, there's a growing uh, uh, concern about what has been done to healthcare by uh, platforms who turned healthcare into an asset. And I think by, by renationalizing certain forms of healthcare and by declaring them a basic right uh, of the people, you avoid uh, what had happened that, uh, that uh, these privatized hospitals have just suppressed so many jobs that they were completely incapable of dealing with uh, the situation, and if uh, the, the, uh, the COVID crisis had happened in the 70s in Italy, um, hospitals were, would have been much more prepared to, to, to respond to that crisis. So basically the privatization of hospitals um, has led to this aggravated catastrophe with many people dying. So I think there is a growing uh, 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 protest against this form of privatized uh, uh, healthcare, which is sold in America and in Europe by these companies as a more efficient way and a more practical way to, to distribute healthcare for everybody. But uh, if you look actually if, uh, into wh who's profiting from it, it's these companies and not the people. And I think in the moment where we would basically reclaim also the organization of people's data uh, to the benefit of a more efficient healthcare by the state, then it could uh, uh, really lead to a revolution in healthcare. And, uh, uh, and then it's important that, of course, the sensible data is not harvested in a way that is detrimental to uh, self-determination and personal rights, but it's much easier to negotiate that w when the state 
runs these uh, um, programs and uh, programs these algorithms than if it's done by private companies who sell your very sensitive information in a totally irresponsible way and participate in the destruction of the healthcare system. And so I think that is that is just an example of how it could work if you would regard data as a common good that is organized by the people. Uh, then, then you could develop new forms of healthcare. You could develop a less efficiency-driven way of uh, also acknowledging reproductive work and uh, and having a different take on uh, on the social justice. And and so that is the hope. If if you would basically uh, um, uh, reclaim data uh, and, and turn that into the, the, the basis of a political uh, uh, restructuring of society, then we are at a very positive point in history, yeah? because this is an enormous asset, and if we harvest that in, in, a, in a critical political way and do, don't let it go, it offers a, a real potential to, to create a much more efficient uh, system, efficient in the sense of beneficial to the people and not to the companies. But I think we have to be very clear about that this is an either or option. I would just add, I mean, I, I appreciate the question around the, the role of motivation and understanding motivation because it seems to me that one of the, the, the things um, that's happening there or, or, or connecting to what Nicholas is just describing is it has to do with the way that value systems change and the way the value systems are constructed and it seems to me that in the past year and a half, as something like logistics, data, these things have been in the, in the news cycle in a way that they haven't been in the past. And I, I have a, I'm optimistic that because of that, there's a growing awareness of the role that all these privatized systems are playing. And there have been moments of, of resourceful reinvention where people are, are finding ways to, to connect a surplus here and a deficit there, but I think more what it's revealing to me at least is the the brittleness of, of so many of the systems and the kind of fundamental incompatibilities because of of what you might call kind of upstream specificity that that the the specificity of, of these different supply chains uh, are just not compatible with each other and as a result then it becomes really difficult to overcome those without thinking about compatibility at a higher scale but I I'm encouraged by things like the New Zealand well-being budget for example as a way of reasserting a different set of values around um, what a society should do. So I think that would have a number of, of these kinds of consequences. So I think that looking to those kinds of things and then understanding how those would, would play out at the, at the physical environment, I think for me would be, is, is something exciting. I mean, I think for infrastructure isn't, doesn't necessarily have a kind of, I think it's a, it can be open to all sorts of different uh, implementations, let's say. We had two more questions. If anybody else has questions, give me a sign, please. Then we can kind of wrap it up. One, qu one more question there, one more there. So I suppose if you guys, we do two questions a second, then uh, followed by um, two, uh, like uh, you, you answer um, in combination, and then we do two more to wrap it up. Is that okay? Hi, uh, my name's Liv, and I have a question about um, virtual space versus physical space, because your talk um, made it very clear how important it is to think about the actual space material and energy that is um, implicated in these data, in, in, in the, the maintenance and how you said harvesting <laughs> of data. So, um, so I was th I, w I was trying to imagine um, the kind of interaction between people, or humans, and data, and whether that would happen naturally in physical space or maybe also in virtual space. Because I um, I think on the one hand it makes a lot of sense to bring the um, physical space of data into like public awareness, and at the same time when I imagine this sort of a a, a data farm, like how would humans really interact with data? It, it, it kind of made me think of the barcode and how we can't really interact with the barcode without a machine, and in, in some ways we can't really interact with data without machines. So I was, I was just wondering what, what your thoughts are, both of your thoughts are on how virtual space would play into that. 
Thank you. And I suggest we take the next question a second and have uh, two more a second you can give in combined answer. Is this addressed to uh, uh, Nicholas or Jesse in particular, or both of them? Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm sort of interested in, you know, let's say um, the sort of the axis of, of power insofar as data processing and housing is concerned goes to public entities, how that might affect um, regulatory regimes like uh, the GDPR or the e-privacy directive, if that might actually sort of simplify things or um, if you might even see more pushback from places like the United States where the viewpoint is almost 180 degrees from what it is in, in the EU. Thank you. Jesse, you want to start? Um, well, I, mean, to, I think to the first question about virtual versus physical space, I mean, I think that that's, um, yeah, I mean, this is one of the, certainly one of the challenges of, 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 of nourishing that kind of imagination that could, could, could help us understand what that, what, how we could interact with this. But I mean, even I think we're, I mean, I think with, with something like Walmart, I think to some extent Amazon also, there, there's already that detachment. It's not virtual space of, of, um, of, of like a virtual reality, but it's the sort of virtual space of, of uh, sitting at a workstation 5,000 miles away from the, the, the point of the, the, where your consequences, where the consequences of your decisions will be felt. And so I think that that's, um, the nature of the operations has already produced this kind of, you know, split between those, um, where to a large extent, something like um, the operations of a company like Walmart has already is already functionally virtual from the point of view of where decisions are made. Um, but I think that maybe connects to the, to the earlier, I wanted to, I mean, to the earlier question about decentralization too, because it seems like one of the ways that, that you know, Walmart's been effectively met uh, from a resistance point of view is when those who are, you know, in the kind of minor form of power found are accept the logics of the company and meet it on those terms and then disrupt it on its own terms, rather than insisting on, you know, their specialness of their community, but rather understanding that they're just one of many uh, places that fulfill a set of criteria, and if they understand that, then they can actually interfere. So, um, so I, I, I think, yeah. So I'll leave it there for that one. I maybe I think Nicholas might be able to speak better to the regulatory dimension. No, also, yeah, I, I think it's um, it's already visible in in some cities where basically public data is collected and turned almost directly into uh, uh, political action, that you can see that there are new forms of uh, citizens' participation possible uh, by collecting their input, uh, um, analyzing the input uh, with algorithms written by, uh, by basically state authorities or four state authorities and then develop new forms of, of uh, urbanistic intervention. And if you, if you look at the example of Barcelona, how uh, through the process of collective public data, the process of building new houses, uh, redesigning holes, uh, city neighborhoods uh, was facilitated and made more easy, uh, you see the, the huge potential at the moment when this is not basically organized by private companies, but becomes part of the public infrastructure. And also, uh, you, can, you can see that there is the possibility of massive acceleration in building permits, in uh, um, redoing uh, uh, the, 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 the traffic distribution, etc., cetera, um, and, and trying out forms that might also not work and can be redesigned. So there we have all, all the potential in the world that could be harvested and uh, uh, and, and put into the service of a new form of like uh, participatory town planning, and that is, I think, the big, big chance in that. Mm. There were two more questions. I think, I think we have here. two more. A second, yeah. we start right here. You're first. Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm I'm Jetty, and uh, I'm curious about your both your thoughts on the role of resistance, because. Um, I, I, pre I mean, I, I, pre I appreciate the provocation to kind of reclaim and improve these monstrous things, but I would also argue that the, the opposite of Amazon is not state-run Amazon, but uh, farmer's market and your local hardware store. So what is, are we too far gone or could we just say no, like we 
by architects say no to designing prisons? Yeah, I think for, uh, thank you for that question because I think it, it uh, points at a very, very crucial question. The question is what will happen after basically capitalism has uh, given up certain forms of the city. And, and I, I try to describe it with uh, the idea of, a, of an unprecedented production of ruins. And of course, the question is what will we, what will we do with these ruins and who will uh, uh, will be able to use these ruins and use them differently. And, and you see it already in, in, in Germany, we have a uh, emerging problem with dead malls. So the private owners of these dead malls are desperate and try to develop together with state authorities uh, new models of using these dead malls differently. For example, as student housing, as housing for uh, larger groups of, of communes. So there is an idea uh, uh, of necessity of redesigning them, of, 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 of squatting, of uh, occupying these ruins that, that capitalism has just produced. And I think that's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful and paradoxical moment that everybody thought that only kind of a left-wing revolution could destroy the, 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 the shopping mall, the office towers, etc. And if you read these pamphlets from the 80s, it's all about the violent uh, uh, socialist revolution that would destroy what destroyed the old city. And now capitalism has destroyed itself because it's, it's more efficient to distribute goods via Amazon, etc. But that also creates a huge possibility for local initiatives, farmer markets, any other less efficiency driven forms of spending time together of, of reproductive work that could occupy the, the city centers in the future. And I think that that potential has to be like politically uh, enabled, but once you find a deal with the owners of all these defunct structures, um, then uh, I see a big potential not to say the state replaces this thinking in centralized hyperscale uh, uh, structures, but, but also to come up with new models of occupying these spaces. Thank you. So you jumped right on that, that question. That's excellent. It's like we have time for one more question, and I'm not sure if I saw a hand in front. There was, I saw you, right? It's like, a, but was there? Yeah, here. Well, okay. Then final question. Thank you. Um, I'm familiar with talking with a mask on, so my apologies if it's muffled. Um, I was intrigued when you earlier, this is to Jesse, when you contrast uh, Walmart and Amazon as being almost opposite, opposite kinds of business models or companies or strategies or, or competen competencies. In my mind, I thought, okay, maybe it's because Walmart is really a rural suburban kind of company. They do best in generic spaces, um, some, somewhat similar to, let's say, McDonald's along the freeway. You know, it's just uh, some generic convenient distance from the, from, the, from the next Walmart. Whereas Amazon, I presume, would make more money if all the buyers are located in Manhattan and San Francisco, because then all the delivery can just take place in, in two giant uh, shipments. Is that part of what you mean? Uh, and if so, does that suggest a kind of architecture that is much more generic, much more abstract, uh, really, frankly, uh, unimportant in the sense that it's just a building in the middle of nowhere. And that's a very, in some ways, refreshing, almost democratic um, bottoming, if you will, of the importance of a particular one building because both Amazon and to, to much a large extent Walmart is really about a very generic, multiplied kind of architecture. And thank you. Did we have one more? That's the, the, the final one. I wasn't sure. Oh, no, I, I, oh, sorry, I wasn't sure if we had it. Yeah, please, please, please. Yeah, so we have one more question from, from you, and I think that's the final question. The final question, okay. We do Got the it. final round. Got it. Well, so it's just basically a question of decentralized versus centralized right, modeling. Right, right. And its relationship to the kind of architecture that yeah. that is used or instantiated by right. that relationship. No, I think it's a great it's a great kind of contrast. Um, I mean, I think to to one extent the um, probably what I was trying to get at I was using. An, I mean, one example that I find helpful is from the from like historians of science who talk about systems builders, and they talk about uh, it's I think in um, Thomas Hughes's book. Um, 
he, we think of Thomas Edison as like the inventor of the light bulb, and Hughes says actually what Edison, he did do that, but he also invented a whole system to sell electricity. Uh, and I think that's where like businesses, like Amazon is more in that world, like of kind of saying, you know, here's this thing that we can, we figured out all these different ways to monetize all these new patterns and technologies. And, and Walmart really was saying, you know, how do we sell stuff to people cheaply? And so I think that's where the kind of like the scope and the ambition is different. And so I think that's where I see them as kind of as two different kind of kinds of things. I mean, one really is a retailer that achieved a certain scale through a counterintuitive attitude to location and, a, and an ability to capitalize and quickly economize on logistical technologies. But then it kind of plateaued where I think something like Amazon um, it's, I think it's just important that we don't call them retailers, you know, like basically, like it's, I mean, as Nicholas was saying, like AWS is like where they get all their revenue, you know, to some extent. And we hear a lot about, I mean, they're, they're of course like expanding dramatically. They, you know, doubled their workforce during 2020. It's just like staggering levels of growth. Um, and so they are, of course, increasingly playing that retail function, but it's just one piece of the operation. The difference there's a real estate question that you're talking about, which is connected maybe to Jenny's question around the value of these things. I mean, in conversations I've had with people who are building data centers, often the land is the thing that's valuable, not the building. And so you're right, I think, to point to the genericness of them. And I think that's what's so fascinating because it's it it confronts us with our own habits and our own assumptions about what why a building is valuable. I mean, data engineers from Google describe them as computer-sized buildings. You know, the, sorry, building-sized computers. <laughs> that they're really, it's just a computer and it's just a computer case, it's just this, but it's a million square feet. Uh, and so that's, that's a very different attitude toward what a building is. And, and I think that's why, though, we're at a moment of, of typological, um, you know, perplexity, because this is this moment where we don't have a, collectively a language to deal with those and we're trying to figure out whether we should or not, or whether those things are gonna matter or whether they'll become um, more, present in our landscapes and, and I recently came across a bit of data that said that was a, a study projecting um, about driverlessness and it estimated that the a driverless car will use 3,000 times the data of a phone in terms of its exchange so 40 terabytes per hour back and forth to be able to navigate. And so if, you, if that were to take place, if that were to become part of our existence, you know, the demand for data centers will not go away, right? Like that's gonna become a huge part of every single building. And I, I meant to include a photograph from the New Museum. Um, if you, next time you go to the New Museum, go to the seventh floor and you look out and you see a history of data in the city because you see the two AT&T Long Lines buildings, you see the Verizon building that's now a data center and then you see the, the um, one on Thomas Street that's the kind of bomb-proof one. And I think that's, it seems like what we're sort of, it will be partly the kind of integration of all these things into our buildings in another way too. So, so I think that the question of, of the representational question is really at the heart of what I'm interested in around, you know, the possibilities of architecture and urbanism, which is, I think, connected to then the political question that, that we've been also addressing. So, so I, I think that the, um, so I appreciate the question around, around the role of cities and suburbs. And I think that's, um, also something we've been confronting, like the role of distribution and, and distance. So it's all connected. <laughs> On that note, it's all connected. We're connected. Um, we're very glad to, say, to have you here tonight. I want to say a huge thanks to uh, Jesse Le Cavalier like, for contributing today and especially for Nicholas uh, Mark to come to, from Germany for this evening. It's like, uh, and for, to you all, it's like for joining the conversation. We will have drinks at the bar if you want to join us and have another question towards, uh, to, to Nicholas or Jesse. I'm sure they're ready to, to respond. There will be wine and, and beer. It's a pleasure to have you here. I would love to draw your attention to the series that this event was part of, which will actually, we were talking about public spaces and utopia during uh, tonight. It's like, uh, the next event will be on um, uh, Monday the 18th with Ilya Toyanov and uh, Benjamin Kunkel, two writers, one American, one German, and they will, call, uh, they will talk about utopias and there will be the discussion about, um, uh, about urban spaces and public spaces and their role for democracy with the Architectural League um, 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 and with uh, two 
uh, uh, urban planners and architecture critics from Germany, Doris Kleilein and Friederike Meyer, and Mariana Magilevich. So we're very happy if, you s if we see you again at these events. I would like to say a thanks to my colleagues, particularly to Catherine Muller for organizing this event. I want to express my thanks to the rest of the team, which is Alison Wade, which is our technician, Mark Paradise, which is Mike uh, Sanabria, who you met at the entrance, and to our intern, Fabio Thieme. Thank you all very much for coming. Join us at the bar. Come again. Uh, sign up our newsletter in case you didn't do yet, and see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>